What's up, y'all? Now listen, before we get into the It's Zach and It's Ade, I just want to go ahead and say, Ade, welcome back. I missed you, dog. <laughs> What's good? What's good? What's good? So listen, um, you know, and our topic actually is very serious this, this episode, but I want to just go ahead and get the jokes out first, because once we get this interview done, I want to go ahead and wrap it right there, right? So, you know... <clears throat> What I love about living corporate is we dismantle, or we seek rather, because I'm not going to let me not say that we dismantle anything, but but we seek to at least address openly uh, different stereotypes, challenges, and um, and biases, you know, for people of color and how they really impact folks, especially in the workplace. And I want to talk about colorism really quick. Now you're going to be like, where am I going with this? Y'all probably listen. Just like, what are you talking about? This cool. So, educational point for my non-melanated brothers and sisters out there, uh, my non-Wakandans, my Buckies, <laughs> not my not Buckies, all right, my Winter Soldiers, if uh, you will. Winter Soldiers, okay. Um, we the, in, in the Black community, we talk about colorism and, and we attribute certain behaviors to certain Black folks of specific hues. Oh, here we go. A popular myth is that lighter skinned black people do not answer their text messages. They I they leave Asian. they they leave um, text messages on red. <sighs> their text messages are on uh, swole, as it were. I can't stand you. And I I, I wanted I want to really recognize Ade. I can't. I only have 250 unread messages. You really can't play me like this, dog. Ade is, um, and I'm not. I'm not gonna compare. I'm not. I hate it when people use food to, to describe uh, women. But Ade is pretty chocolate. Okay, she's pretty dark. You have to fight me after this. And yet she does not read her text messages. You're gonna have to run me the tape. Um, she actually, in fact, just the other day, I texted Ade and she said, oh, hey. And I said, oh, on site. you want to hit me with, you want to hit me with the, oh, <laughs> like, 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 funny to see you here. That's how she hit me with it. Y'all like, oh, are you done? Hey, are you, are you done? <laughs> <laughs> are you done? Are you done? <laughs> See, you can't. You can't even. You can't. You can't pull a me on me. Man, I was so disappointed. I was like, man. I mean, if anything, based on these stereotypes, I should be the one ignoring your text messages. Wish you but would. You know what? For me to ignore Adi's text messages, y'all. Guess what? She'd have to text me in the first doggone place. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> this is a kind of rude. I really did not intend on dealing with on tonight. So I want to say thank you because last week we had. Well, the week before last, excuse me, we had Marty Rogers. You know, it was a big deal. The dude is like, he's like black consulting royalty in the DMV. You would think I didn't want to be on the podcast episode. You know what I mean? You're going to have to fight me. <laughs> I've decided. <laughs> I've decided. It's a fight to the oh, death. Oh, man. So I'm just thankful. I'm just so, this is me. This is me like publicly thanking Ade for being here and for texting me back. Um, I just, I, I just want to say that I'm a good person and I don't deserve this. <laughs> I, you know what I think it was? I think it was the fact that we all got back on Black Planet for a couple of days to check out that Solange content. Mm. I think that reset our chakras. Who is we? Or or Anks? I don't know. I don't know. We we don't have chakras. We don't have chakras. Who we are do. we? I I us don't. as a us as a diaspora. I feel Who? as if that's. Who mm, are you not a Solange fan? You didn't enjoy the Solange album? It's it has to grow on me, and I I understand wow. that that's that is sacrilegious. Uh, oh we. But I will say this. Um, and you supposed to be from the DMV too. Everybody from the DMV like Solange. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I listened. I, I waited until midnight. There's a screenshot on my phone of me starting to listen to this album at like twelve ten. Okay. 10. okay. Um, and I think at around 1220, I was like, you know what? Some things aren't for everybody. Everything, in fact, is not for everybody. 
That's real though. And I, I, I paused and really went to sleep. Wow. You know, I really enjoyed it, but I, but I have to enjoy it because she shouted out Houston a lot on the album, like a lot. So I enjoyed it off of that alone. And I'm also just a huge Solange fan, but you know, I get it. Look, it's one I, step I, at a time. I too, I am a huge Solange, Solange, Solange fan. Goodness. Um, a seat at the table is an everlasting bop of an album. Um, oh, yeah, it is. That's a classic. It's a very good album. It's like perfect. Yeah, this one, this one's just gonna have to pass me by and or grow on me in two to four years. I don't know. Um, you know, it's interesting because it's interesting because I was used to based on a seat at the table. This is not a music podcast, y'all. Um, <laughs> but we're just we're getting our we're getting our fun stuff out the way first. So it's interesting because as a as a person who really enjoys Solange's words, like Seat at the Table, she had a lot of words. Didn't get a lot of words on this album. I'm told that um, it's it's the experience is better if you watch the um, I don't know what what to call it the the, the visual, visual album. Of, yeah, the visual album. In conjunction yeah, I'm, with... I'm, I'm actually gonna peep it. Fun fact: um, a couple weeks ago, I told y'all about uh, me playing Smash Bros. Uh, the video game, and I'm in a group me, and one of the guys who I play Smash Bros. with was actually uh, in the visual album. Oh, really? That's right. Okay. Because I got th- those are the kind of circles I roll in. You know, famous video players, video yeah. game players, <laughs> video, video, video game players, yeah. And as a side note, he's very good at Super Smash Bros. So there, maybe he'll be on the sh- maybe he'll be on the episode on a podcast one day. Who knows? We'll see. Um, okay, so with that, let's do a very hard pivot, sharp left turn, sharp left into our topic for the day. So we're talking about being disabled while other at work, and it's interesting because similar to how we brought up this salon job out of nowhere, I was not really thinking about the fact that we don't really consider the experiences of just disabled people period let alone disabled people of color at work I'm trying to think like how many times have you worked with someone who was a person of color and disabled at work Um, so the the thing to also think through here is the fact that there are lots of hidden disabilities Um, that's fair yeah so there's there's a wide, wide, wide range of um, conditions that physical disabilities can also be invisible. Um, but there are chronic illnesses. You have there are um, mental illnesses, cognitive disabilities, visual impairments, hearing impairments. According to the Census Bureau, apparently um, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, applies to or covers. Um, approximately 54 million Americans. Um, of those, I'm sure many, many millions are um, are people of color or black people in particular. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know how many people or how many people of color I've ever worked with who are disabled um, or who are living with a disability, but I, I certainly think that it's important that as a whole, we think about how to create a more inclusive work culture um, that empowers people with disability, that's not patronizing or um, demeaning um, or just outright hostile. No, I super agree with that. And just a, such a fair call out to say that there's so many folks that um, do, who do not have visible disabilities, um, but, but are who are living with a disability and it's important that we think about that and we think we're thoughtful about that too so again just my own ignorance and it was interesting because in preparing and and researching for this particular episode it was hard to find comprehensive data especially content that was specific to black and brown disabled experiences I think for me kind of taking a step back going back to answer my own question Individuals I worked with who have a, a visible disability, I have not worked with anybody in my career who has had a visible disability, um, visible to me anyway. Right. 
And, you know, I think it's interesting. I was reading a piece. It was called Black and Disabled. When Will Our Lives Matter? And it was written by Eddie Nudopu. And uh, this was back in 2017. Uh, head of Am- He's the head of Amnesty International's Youth Engagement Work for Africa. And his overall premise was that historically black resistance and civil rights and things of that nature has always presented um, the black body as the, the the point of resistance, right? right? And ultimately, the image of the black form is one of strength and and solidarity and, and able-bodiedness, right? And it's, it's presenting this strong, um, quote-unquote, normal body as the ideal to then push up against oppression, systemic racism. And I'm going to present this, and I want, I'm going to dare you to try to break this form, this body. Um, and in that, there's a certain level of bias because it then automatically erases the idea of a of different bodies of disabled bodies um and if that's the case then it's like okay well then where do, where do they fit in this narrative where do they fit in our story where do they fit in our resistance right um and so it's just really interesting to me because i think it's just kind of calling out our own blind spots as much as living corporate as we aspire to talk about and highlight these the experiences and perspectives of underrepresented people in corporate America is season two and we're just not talking about being disabled while other at work. Right. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it really confirmed for me how little I think about my privilege as an able-bodied person. It's a huge privilege in the fact that we're seen. We think that we're invisible in, 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 in a variety of ways we are, but disabled people of color are even much less visible than we are. Right. Um, And I also think that now is such a good time to start thinking through um, the conversations that we should be having um, because we live in a time and a space where everyone's rights Um, are sort of up for grabs Um, and it's especially important that we are holding space um, and creating a safe space for people who have less privilege than we do Um, and it's not enough that you give it a passing thought because then you might as well just be saying thoughts and prayers right um and I think that if you have the ability to do something, um it's and and you know, opinions may vary, but I'm firmly of the belief that if you have the ability to do something, it is your responsibility to do something. Um and even if what you're doing is something so simple as having a conversation or amplifying the voice, um of those who are able to have that conversation. I agree with that. Um, and that's really all the more reason why I'm excited and thankful for the guest that we had today. Her name is uh, Vitalissa Thompson. Um, she is a, a disabled activist, public speaker, educator, consultant, and writer. You got to work. Yeah. She knows she, she putting in the, she's putting in the work. Um, and and we had a great conversation, and I really want y'all to hit, hear it and check it out. So this is what I'm gonna do. Uh, we're gonna transition. Wait, you know what, Adi? So I know we said we, we got the jokes in. We got jokes in the beginning because I really wanted to give space for my listen. We're going to. Do we want to come back and do favorite things? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's do. All right, that. cool, 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 cool. So this is what we'll do. So we'll go in our conversation with our listen. We'll talk about that, and then we'll get into the favorite things. Awesome. Okay. All right. Talk to y'all soon. And 
we're back. And as we shared before the break, we have Vilissa Thompson on the show. Vilissa, how are you doing? I am doing great. <laughs> no, we're really excited for you to uh, to be here. So today we're talking about being disabled and being a person of color. Can you talk a bit about Ramp Your Voice and where that idea came from and its mission and just mm-hmm. give us the origin story? Yes. Well, Ramp Your Voice was founded in 2013, um, you know, as a way for me to discuss my experiences as a black disabled woman, as a social worker, and just the things that I've just noticed with my professional world as well as personally. Um, when I, a year before that, I started blogging more as a social work blogger that was um, discussing social work through the disabled lens, um, talking about different issues on that front, where and that wasn't really popular within the profession at that time. Um, the profession had just started doing more things online, people coming up with different blogs and different platforms. So at the beginning of that, that really kind of helped me get to where I am when it comes to blogging, talking about the disabled experience from many different angles. So getting that experience in 2012 led me to create Ramp Your Voice in 2013. And with five years now, soon to be going on six in 2019, you know, it has really grown into this organizational aspect to where, you know, I'm able to project myself as a, um, a voice within the community that really calls out some of the myths, you know, in a light you know, light way of saying it, right. uh, that happens within the disabled community as well as um, getting those who are in the broader society to understand that disability, you know, is very much a facet, you know, in the people as well as the yeah, different identities and experiences. Um, for me, basically, I like to call myself a right for troublemaker because I don't feel that you're really doing good work, particularly when you're doing social justice, you know, if you're not shaking the table, if you're yeah. not Ticking off somebody. For sure. No, Valis, I, I was agreeing with you because I think that, you know, when you're talking about topics around race and gender and really any any topic around equity, right? Like and mm-hmm. and, and affirming or empowering uh, disenfranchised groups, often ignored groups, right? Like the disabled community, the disabled people of color community. Right. If there isn't some type of discomfort there then there probably isn't going to be any growth, right? Like in, in any other context, when we talk about uh, getting better or mm-hmm. growing, like there's some type of discomfort there, right? So like professional development or working out and getting new muscles or just growing as a person. Like, you know, you, you, right. have, you have, you have pains having, having a child, there's pains associated with that. So there's a, just historically, and just as a matter of life, when you change, change and pain kind of, they go hand in hand and they have historically in the, in this nation as well. So it's just funny how, um, we often try to avoid that. Right. Right. Like we mm-hmm. try to, we try to avoid discomfort while at the same time seeking to like enhance the platform of others. And it's like that does, they, they, they can't go hand in hand. Um, okay. Right. And I do want to say that sometimes, you know, changing things start from within. I know that, particularly with the disabled community, there has been a lot of shakeups um, due to, you know, the calling out of the racism that's within the disabled community when it comes to leadership, the kind of good old boys club that really, you know, reigns true since, you know, when people think about disability, you know, what usually comes to mind is a white face, usually a white male face. And a lot of the leadership are white disabled men who have a lot of racist, um, sexist views, who resist the change that is needed. And I think that there has been this surgence of disabled people of color to be able to ramp their voice, you know, in a sense, to talk about the issues that matter to them, to bring forth a more diverse understanding of disability history that is not just white faces or white experiences. So I think that part of what I have experienced and others who do this activism work, you know, is shaking the table within to really get the change that you want outside, you know, of your own sphere. Let me ask this, cause I, and I find this, I find this genuinely interesting because again, mm-hmm. I don't believe that I consider the perspectives and experience, experiences of the disabled 
and disabled people of color. Like, so I don't, that entire community. So for able-bodied folks like myself, just people who aren't conscious of that mm-hmm. experience, can you explain to me some of the, the different ways that um, unconscious bias, bias and racism rear its head within the disabled community? Yes. Uh, one way is, you know, like I was saying, you know, who is disabled? Um, you know, not really considering disabled people of color. You know, when we see the telethons and the marathons and, you know, the call for, you know, charities is usually, you know, white faces. And that, you know, visible uh, erasure and representation allows communities of color to not see themselves uh, when communities of color, particularly black and native communities, especially have high rates of disability. So that erasure alone is very dangerous, you know, when there are certain racial groups who have a high prevalence of disability. And then when you break that down further into the community of color themselves, you know, I can you know, speak for the black community. You know, we do have a resistance to, you know, identifying as disabled or calling somebody's, you know, condition disabled. You know, we have these kind of cutesy words for it, but like, you know, so-and-so, you know, they, you know, they may, you know, think like this or, you know, so-and-so may be a little, you know, quirky or anything like that. And, you know, I think that, you know, for me, that has really impacted how I look at my Black disabled body, you know, as somebody who's been disabled since birth, I really didn't identify as disabled until I started doing this work because I didn't know that being disabled had its own identity and culture and pride and that there is a community of people that look like me and people that don't look like me and people who are wheelchair users like myself, people who are of shorter stature or little people or little women, you know, so that, you know, invisibility when it comes to media, when it comes to the work that organizations do, really impacts one's ability to connect to an identity that's outside of their race and gender. So I really think that, honestly, both disabled and not disabled people, you know, are both heavily disadvantaged due to that invisibility. I know that, you know, in coming to this space, I see a lot of particularly Black folks who are disabled, particularly those who have invisible or non-apparent disabilities like mental illness, chronic pain, Those are all disabilities, you know, but we don't call those things that and can really create this disconnect in one's body and mind and what's going on within one's body and mind, as well as understanding that being disabled is just as strong of an identity as your gender and your race. So for me, connecting to particularly Black disabled women and femmes is letting them know that it's okay to talk about your disability. You know, it's okay to talk about your mental illness. It's okay to talk about your chronic pain. It's okay to talk about the um, lack of medical assistance that you get because you are, you know, a triple minority. You know, I really think that that type of visibility allows those open conversations, allows those community resource sharing or just tips shared, you know, or just, you know, plain support to occur. So for me, I really want us to all kind of take a step back and say that, hey, you know, disabled people are the largest minority group in the world and in the country, and we all know somebody with disability. It is not us ourselves who are disabled. So being disabled isn't just some identity that doesn't reach home in some way, shape, or form. It does. No, and I think that's the main disconnect that I see is people not understanding a community that is so vast, so diverse, and it's one where we do know somebody. And to not change the perception that we have about disabled people and the lives that we're able to live. So, you know, that's just kind of the things that I notice, you know, when it comes to not disabled people, everybody people, not understanding things, and what disabled people like myself who do activism work, you know, have to kind of teach you all and also have to bring you all into the fold um, for those who are actually disabled, who may not at this point or for whatever reasons, um, usually do the stigma or shame, identify. In that you shared about being a triple minority, you talked about identity. As discussions around inclusion and diversity become more and more commonplace today, 
and more centered in pop culture, frankly, the term mm-hmm. intersectionality is used a lot. So mm-hmm. can, can you talk to me about what intersectionality means for you? And I'm, I asked that because you, you shared that uh, you being disabled is, is an entire identity to itself. And it is right. It's, it's, it's a part of who you are. It shapes how you navigate and move around this world, how you see the world at the same right. time, you are a woman at the same time you are a black woman. So I'm curious to know, how do you navigate the the intersection of those? And, and of course, those those are just three. You have, certainly, you have various other ways that you identify right. yourself. However, how do you how do you navigate the various uh, points of intersection for yourself? Well, I think that you know when I talk about intersectionality, I think what's so critical is that people cannot separate my identities because I won't let them. You know, being black is just as important to me as being a woman, as being disabled. And you cannot look at me and just simply divide me into three different ha- three different parts. You know, each of my identities has interwoven into this, to me, beautiful fabric of my being. And the world reacts to me, you know, in in the ways in which my identities present themselves, you know. Some people may not care that I'm black, but because I'm a woman, that's a problem. Some people may not care that I'm a woman, but because I'm a wheelchair user, that makes them uncomfortable. Some people may not care that I'm a wheelchair user, but because I'm black, that's the biggest issue. So when I go out into the world, I don't know at times which of these identities are people reacting to. Or sometimes I can tell, depends on if they're very open about what may make them uncomfortable or what their... um, I guess, quote unquote, offended by, you know, by my mere existence. So for me, the world, you know, looks at me and judges me on those three primary identities that I have. And they make assumptions about my capabilities, my intellect, my social status, my educational status, you know, just everything about me. And the one thing I always say about assumptions is, you know, the word assumption has, you know, A-S-S at the beginning of it. So you can make yourself look like an, you know, unintentional by making assumptions. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I really think that those assumptions has really shaped, you know, my experience. And, and particularly when I learned about the term intersectionality, it just really, you know, was like a light bulb moment. Like, oh, my gosh, that makes so much sense because. I look at myself in the mirror. I see a black disabled woman. You know, I see, you know, I'm a Southerner. I'm from South Carolina. So, you know, I understand what it means to be in a small Southern town, you know, to live in a red state, to have this type of history that is attached to the South. As a woman, I understand, you know, sexism and the way that women are paid less and the um, harassment and the sexual assaults that women go through, you know, with our bodies and our mere existence. And as disabled, you know, we experience all those things. You know, disabled women, particularly those with intellectual disabilities, have the highest rates of experiencing sexual violence. So, in that example, you know, you have the connection of gender and race, and gender and disability. You know, when it comes to being a person of color, disabled people have the um, highest rates of police brutality over, you know, half of police brutality rates are uh, conducted on, you know, disabled people. And a good portion of those people who have been, you know, these either survivors or victims or police brutality have been disabled people of color. So in that example, you have the race and disability factor. So, you know, just in those type of statistics alone, you know, I go on and on about the disparities when it comes to race, gender, and disability, you really cannot separate someone's experience and the disparities that they may encounter because of who they are. Let me ask this, you know, in the work that you do with Ramp Your Voice, and of course, as a, as a professional, as an adult, can, <laughs> can you talk to us a little bit about how to effectively support disabled people of color in the workplace? Mm-hmm. Well, I know that with my particular work journey has been um, in some ways unusual, you know, when it comes to how non-disabled people may look at it. But for disabled people, it's not really unusual at all. As I say, I am, you know, a social worker. When I got my MSW in 2012, 
I had wanted to look at traditional social work routes. And the one thing I found is that the requirements for uh, social work positions, particularly those that deal with case management, um, DSS or CPS, you know, et cetera, requires you to either have a vehicle or be able to go out to homes. And as a wheelchair user, I know that majority of homes are not wheelchair um, accessible. And as someone who did not have the ability to obtain a car because I was on SSI at the time, you know, that financial burden was there as well. So I quickly realized that if I wanted to make a niche for myself within social work, I'm most likely going to have to do a non-traditional uh, social work route. And luckily for me, I went from being a micro focus, which dealt with uh, families, individuals, and groups, and was more macro focus, which dealt with activism, um, community building, so so on and so forth. And that's what kind of got me into writing and got me into Ramp Your Voice. So for me, many disabled people are like myself, where we have these barriers. We have these systemic barriers where it comes to the job requirements, like I mentioned, you know, being a wheelchair user. And you also have the systemic barriers when it comes to government agencies as well. You know, with being on SSI, I knew that I would have to have a job that gave me insurance because my SSI and my health care, which was Medicaid, were connected. So if I was to lose the SSI, that means I would lose the Medicaid. So let me ask this. What is, what is S, for those who don't know and myself included, mm-hmm. what is yes. SSI? SSI is basically Social Security. There's two okay. types of Social Security. SSI is what those who have not yet put into, into the system get. Basically, those like myself who are born with, dis, with disabilities, um, basically like younger kids whose parents make uh, within the, I guess, income requirements, are able to, able to get them enrolled on it. And then there's SSDI. So those of us that work, we put into the SSDI system. So for me, I was on the SSI system because I hadn't put it into the system yet. So for me, while I was building my brand, I was still looking for, you know, different types of employment. Luckily, I lived at home um, with my grandmother at the time, and, you know, I was able to stay with her. You know, I lived with her my whole life, so I was able to stay with her and build up this brand. And then when she passed at the end of 2015, I knew that I would have to get some type of employment. So I, you know, was able to get by the end of 2016 and that allowed me to get off of social security because I had health insurance you know that's the I think unique situation that disabled people endure is that these are these systemic barriers now some disabled people are not able to get off um, particularly Medicaid because they have comprehensive health care needs and private insurance would not pay for some of those extensive health care needs that they have, like having a personal care assistant, someone coming to their home, helping them with their activities of daily living, like dressing, bathing, so on and so forth. So somebody, or they may need certain equipment, you know, that private insurance may not cover because it's, you know, very expensive. So some to say that people are not able to get off the roads at all, and they have to be very mindful of how much income they may have to take in, how that can affect it. Their um, either Medicaid and or Social Security, particularly if they're both connected, um, and what does that look like? Um, so this puts disabled people in the perils of poverty because I know that when I was on Social Security, I was getting seven hundred and thirty something dollars a month, which is nothing, <laughs> you know, to live off of. Right, absolutely. So, yeah, and that's like a month. So mm-hmm. you know, just think about that. That's for some people. That's their rent. You know, that's a rent um, payment. And that's, so, and, that's some, and that's some cheap rent, too. Exactly. You know, so I think that what non-disabled people don't really realize is that when it comes to employment, disabled people have a lot to consider. And in some cases, a lot to lose that could put their livelihoods and at times very lives on the line. So when it comes to employment, you do have to be very strategic about what kind of jobs you take, what kind of money you take. If you can take money, what does that look like? And so on and so forth. I know that for me, I was willing to do things for free while I was on Social Security because I knew the consequences of taking money while on Social Security. That was my main source of income. Wow. So that's a lot to take into consideration. A lot. And when it comes to disabled people of color, 
we have the highest rates of unemployment uh, within the disabled community. Disabled black folks have the highest rates of unemployment in the community. So, you know, it's not only us having these hoops to go through, but also people not being willing to hire us when it comes to looking for employment. So let's get back on Ramp Your Voice a little bit. I love the writings Mm -hmm. and the photos and the resources. Where can people learn more about Ramp Your Voice and what all do you have going on in 2019? All right. Well, Ramp Your Voice is going to be doing some very collaborative works. Uh, Right now I have a speaking agent uh, where I will be doing a lot of speaking gigs, signing up for universities. So if anybody wants me to come speak, you can sign me up for that. Uh, reach out to me and I can connect you with my agent. And that has been a great experience that just occurred um, this year to be able to connect with somebody who understands the vision that I have with my work uh, and my voice and what I want to do with that, do more writing. I'm in the process of right now working on my children's book, which is a picture book. This has been kind of like my baby for a very long time. And I'm now in the position to work on it the way that I desire to and bring it to life. Um, right now, I don't have a publisher for that, but um, definitely looking for one. Uh, right now, I'm also looking to writing. I love writing about race, gender, and disability, um, the intersectionalities of different things like you know, pop media, media representation, um, healthcare, social work. So right now, I'm just continuing to build the brand, continuing to talk about the experiences from a Black disabled womanist um, perspective. Um, and just really continuing to, you know, cause trouble. Like one of the things I do enjoy doing <laughs> is educating, you know, non-disabled folks, particularly those who are professionals in the medical medical field, the health and professions field, like myself with social workers, um, therapists, really understanding disability outside of the medical model, which is basically, you know, talking about disability from a diagnosis standpoint, as well as the first-person language, we're saying people with disabilities instead of the identity-first language, which is disabled people, disabled men, disabled women, and really getting them into the social model understanding of disability, which is more about, you know, disability being a, you know, identity, a culture, a community. So that's kind of what I offer for professionals who really want to ensure that if they're trying to engage with disabled people through their work, maybe through recruiting, you know, for their um, hiring practices, you know, whatever that they're interested in, make sure that they understand the language because every community has its particular language that you need to know to be able to better relate and engage with those community members so you don't be out of date and at times unintentionally offensive by using outdated terms. So those are the things that I offer that I'm really looking forward to doing more of in 2019, as well as a couple other projects that I can't really say just yet, but wow. um, just really, <laughs> but just really, you know, expanding the brand, um, particularly since um, there's so many great disabled voices out there who are doing incredible work. You know, just making sure that what I'm doing is always fresh and always being welcome to reaching new audiences, reaching new um, professions and new worlds that. You know, disabled people live in, you know, just because somebody doesn't self-identify as disabled doesn't mean that disabled people aren't in your organization, aren't in your community. I appreciate you educating me and I'm sure many of our listeners. Uh, and I'm, I'm, sh- I'm curious, though, before we get out of here, do you mm-hmm. have any parting words, any shout outs? Well, I just, you know, just really want to thank you for allowing me to be on here. Just know that disabled people are here and we are not going anywhere. And if you don't know a disabled person, you need to step your game up and really, particularly if you are a professional and see the ways in which your organization, your body of work is being exclusive, you know, excluding disabled people and how you could be more inclusive of disabled people and ensuring that if you're going to include disabled people, they, they represent vast you know, gender, race, you know, sexual orientations, you know, identities, because we need more to say with people of color, say with people of color who are LGBT, you know, in those type of spaces. Vilissa, I have to thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much, Vilissa. We look forward to having you back on the show. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Peace.
And we're back. Hey. That was an amazing interview. Um, beyond, I think, inspiring, which I, I don't think is a term that I really want to use there. Um, but pardon my, my lack of uh, access to language right at this point. But um, I think Vilisa's story is... Um, it's a call to action, right? It is, um, and I don't know if everyone um, has gotten the opportunity to go to Ramp Your Voice and, and just take a look around, but there is actually an, an anthology. I, I was struggling with that for a second there. There's an anthology on Ramp Your Voice where um, Vilisa actually did an amazing job at um, collecting a black disabled woman syllabus um and i i did some work and went through and read um some of the the articles that i hadn't had access to or, or read before um and it's amazing it is um uh, a body of work that i think everyone should 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 read not just because it gives you um a really If you can hear something crunching in the background, that's my dog Benjamin. He wanted to be featured on the on the podcast today, so he has. What's some up, thoughts. Benji? Yeah, we can definitely hear him. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. So um, this list has um, important thoughts, um, like the stigma of being black and mentally ill complexities and messiness, race, gender, diversity, and the carceral mind, which was an incredibly, incredibly important read. How I dragged myself out of the abyss that is depression without a prescription, disabled black people, just very, very important works and in many, many different formats. So you have music, audio, video, poetry and fiction, books, articles. I say all that to say that there is um, a treasure trove of really important and interesting work so i encourage everyone and we'll include the link to the syllabus but i encourage everyone to take a look at at this work i don't even remember where i got started with singing by lisa's phrases but yeah amazing interview no super dope and i definitely appreciate my lisa joining the podcast We'll definitely make sure to have all of our information in the show notes. JJ, give me some of them air horns for if I listen. Go ahead, give them to me. Put them in here. Hey, thank you, thank you. Part of me wants to let off some of them blop blops, uh, Ade, but you know we're, we're a professional podcast. <laughs> Again, all I have to say is that celebratory gunshots are absolutely situationally appropriate. Man. My goodness! One day I'm gonna have. One day I'm gonna have um, the CEO of my current job. He gonna be on the podcast. We gonna let them blop blops go. Watch. I mean, that might be the same. That might be the same podcast we talk about respectability politics too. Just to make, make some of y'all real mad. I am here for <laughs> all that action, all of it. I'm here for it, um, man. So I'm definitely excited. So I have not read any of the pieces on here. I, I clicked the anthology and I see any that. Cause we're I, about haven't, to I haven't read any of the I haven't I haven't read the pieces on here I haven't <gasps> I haven't no so look I don't even the black what feminism or uh, the womanism category no I'm being honest oh you have some homework oh no I have I'm a, I have mad homework I have mad homework so I have the I'm looking at the anthology the anthology is a, is a requesting content right it's requesting content but then I see right here to your point there's a bunch of stuff on here. The Harriet Tubman casting, cripping up issue. Aunt V, Queen Sugar, black women and our disabled bodies while we're still whole. Luke Cage, the black disabled superhero we need. If I die in police custody. Um, there's no, no, there's, I mean, why black history matters. There's great content here. And really, there's no reason um, for y'all not to check this out. Just like there's no reason for me not to check it out further. Amen. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. So, let's go ahead and get into these favorite things. 
Oh, I, I just want to say go for. W- one last I'll thing um, before we move on. I think that it is incredibly important as we um, amplify the voices of people of color who are disabled, particularly black people, particularly black women who are um, disabled. I think it's important that we contextualize black history and the black experience within um, this paradigm. Um, And I had to sit back and think through, um, for example, Harriet Tubman, who we know historically had uh, seizures. She she was injured over the course of her um, enslavement and had to deal with severe um, seizures over for the rest of her life, um, which brought on these visions that she attributed to a religious, like a sacred experience. Um, but I, I think of how important it is to, one, contextualize these experiences and to fully give Harriet Tubman her due, right? Because uh, if we lose the pieces uh, that, that really and truly make up who she is, we are not truly honoring her, right? Um, and I think that that's real. If we acknowledge that, you know, Harriet Tubman was a black woman, an enslaved woman, um, a disabled woman, in a time that made no space for any parts of her, um, I think we really and truly start to understand and give honor to who she was. Um, as opposed to having, honestly, a very surface level understanding of who she was and magnifying her in a shallow way, I would say. So, yeah, Harriet Tubman, amazing woman, disabled woman. I cannot (laughs) sing her phrases enough, obviously. I mean, duh, Harriet Tubman. I mean, duh. Um, But yeah, it's so important that we talk about these things because... It's it's so easy to to gloss over the fullness of who a person was. Okay. So with that being said, now we're ready for our favorite things. Ade, what you got going on? What's your favorite thing right now? So my one favorite thing right now is this guy um, who demanded cuddles and rubs. So he is over here, face all in my lap, um, while I try to record. I. I, I promise you, he is just big old face in my lap. Um, his favorite thing, his favorite thing to do is to either jump right on top of my stomach, all fifty pounds of him, when I am laying in bed and minding my own black business, um, or he likes to when I am sitting on the couch, literally hop on the couch and put his butt in my face. It's like his favorite thing. Um, this sounds a bit, oh oh this is a dog this is Benji yes this yes yeah yes there is there isn't a random man running around in my I life was, I was like wait why is he a it's a grown man he weighs fifty pounds he's jumping on your stomach what? I would have so so many more problems um, if that were in what? fact the case that's crazy I was like wait this is this is something this is too much going on okay so Benji is your favorite thing right oh, now and my other favorite thing uh, is the Code Newbie mm-hmm. podcast I stopped listening for a little while because what's what's the name the say to Code you? Newbie podcast um, okay what's that what's the Code Newbie a podcast? a podcast dedicated to educating um, folks like me who are either transitioning into tech or even like if you're a CS student in college or whatever it may be um, a new grad, uh, either undergraduate, master's student, if you were um, graduating from a boot camp, all of it. it. It just educates an entire community of, of learners, and I love it so much. It's, you know, after living corporate, my favorite podcast to listen to. Hey, okay. What about you? That's what's up. No, no. Um, first of all, shout out to Benji and to all 
the dogs it's out there. Tough. Woof, woof. Not woof. Did you just? Okay, DMX. <laughs> no, DMX be like, <laughs> I can't no, even do it. I can't even do it now. Don't, don't even on, attempt it. Put me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> all right. You know what I'm saying? You know, what I'm like that's what be that would be DMX. Okay, little DMX. Yes, uh, ZMX. What's up? Uh, so. Also, you know, we need to start doing our shout outs. So this reminds oh, me. Yeah. Shout out to uh, the college age people who listen to our podcast. Shout out to the uh, Buckies, the uh, AKA the Allies, AKA the Winter Soldiers out mm-hmm. there. Shout out to uh, the the Wakandans, AKA my true uh, Africans. Um, shout out to my Jamaican veteran who allow us to get these pew, 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 off every episode. Thank y'all for the encouragement. Honestly, I think it's tolerated at this point, but shout out to y'all anyway. Shout out to y'all. Shout out to the corporate gangsters. Um, sh- shout out to Wall Street. Shout out to uh, the folks who don't have nothing to do with it. Just listen to podcasts all day. Shout out to y'all. Shout out to those of you who have in the last three days or so deployed a per my last email. I see you. I recognize your struggle um, and go ahead and CC HR if necessary, beloved. It's okay. Amen. Shout out to uh, those who drink water every day. Shout out to y'all. And if you are listening with us right now, feel free to reach over to a glass of water um, or a water bottle of some sort and take a sip. Shout out to my people. Um, Shout out to, to all of my black people and all of my white people, a.k.a. I, all of the people who know they need to wear lotion, all those who don't really wear lotion like that. Shout out to all of y'all. Um, and then, of course, shout out to all my coworkers and colleagues who listen to uh, the Living Corporate Podcast. Shout out to y'all. You know, cool. it's funny because I don't really tell my coworkers about our podcast just in case I need to shade them on the podcast. See, well, see, that's what happens. That's what happens when you not you don't live your truth. See? Um, you you gotta you need to tell your coworkers about the podcast. So I, I just need shade to shave no, them directly to their faces because you should definitely I mean, them. To, I'm with that energy. Should, it's just that you should definitely you should definitely shade people to their faces just as a as a principle in life. I, I so here's the thing. I, I struggle with that because I would love to shade you in person and do your face and very loudly. Um, well, no, that's not quite shade. That's just yelling. Um, However, I also hold the sincere belief that I just work here. It is not my job to educate you about your silliness. So I don't know. There's like a spectrum of behavior. And I don't know how willing I am to invest time in raising adults. So. I mean, I feel that. I'm going to continue struggling with that. See, I I genuinely love my job. Like, I'm in a very unique place in my career. I love my job. I I have a great relationship with all of everybody in my practice. Like, I love my team. So, like, shout out to them. Um, And so, I have no issue with letting people know that I have a podcast. Plus, it's a professional podcast. Like, we don't be talking crazy on here. We haven't even let any blop blops. We haven't even let any blop blops go. I hear you. I I love my job as well. Um, Although, on occasion... I do sincerely doubt the judgment of some folks. Um, That's real. So I don't know. I'm going to struggle with that a little bit longer and, and let you know how I feel about it. Okay. If I'm well, deploying. Uh, here's a link to my podcast and you know, an email all thread. It's a good. It's a good. It's also good for your personal brand. I mean, I think you know it's, it's almost been a year since we've been out. I feel like it's about time you let people know you're on a podcast. Very fair point. You know what I'm saying? You know? We were in the middle of these shout outs. Oh, right. So, favorite things. So, my favorite thing right now has to be uh, Desus Samara on Showtime. Okay? So, you know, there are a few things that give me inspiration and joy at the same time. And Desus Samara happened to be one of them. I love uh, their style. Uh, I love their content. Super funny. Very engaging. And has a certain level of just comedic timing that I I, <laughs> I aspire to have. They're wonderful. Um, so I love their show. Um, this is not a this is not a, pl- a paid promo ad. I don't even think we have enough juice to get 
ad space for Jesus and Mero. No, 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 no. Retract that energy right now. Retract it. Retract You're right. It. I'm going to take it back. I'm going to take it back and add a year instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. Yep. Yes. Uh, but, but no, I, 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 I really enjoy their content. So shout out to them. And that really leads me to my question before we get into the wrap up. Do you think we should have some, like some AKAs on the show? Like not the not the sorority. Shout out to y'all those. Oh, I re- I really was about to be like, excuse me. <laughs> no 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 no. Like AKA is like like Zach Nunn, AKA AKA so and so, AKA that guy, AKA, AKA, AKA Mister Such and Such, AKA Z- ZMX, AKA ZMX, AKA per my last email, AKA CC your boss, CC your manager. My wife's looking at me and saying, no, don't do any of that. I okay. yes, I I really was about to be like, mm, this could escalate very very quickly, and the only AKA that I am known for is not work appropriate. So I'm just gonna move on. <laughs> Oh yeah, Candace said no. I'm standing in my truth, sitting. I'm sitting in my truth. My wife took her laptop, moved it off of her lap to her side, and then moved her head from the left to the right, to the left again, to the right again, and then back to the left to tell me no. Okay, well, she's a wise woman. She is. We have been rambling for so long. We have, but you know, that is this is actually part of a podcast. You know, people, y'all been saying that we're not. You know, sometimes we come across a little too scripted. Look, we've been we've been kicking it this episode. If y'all like, if y'all kick it with us, you know. Actually, this is the last thing before we go. You know how like every podcast and or like artist group, they have something that they call their fans. Like Beyonce has the Beehive, right? Like Rihanna. Um, uh, BTS has they call them they, their fans call themselves the army. Like should we should we have a should we have any type of an employee resource group, sir? No, no, <laughs> no, no. What we call our fans. You think we call should they be the employee resource group? That'd be super funny. No, they got they have to give themselves an and it, you know something like our living corporators. You know what I'm saying? Something it has to be something where we give them like a name. There has to be a name. I don't. Right. So like, let's think I'm through sure, this. I, we gotta think y'all send it, us right? some suggestions yeah y'all send us some suggestions like what do y'all want to be called y'all can't be called the living corporate hive that's mad corny um can't be called the L Sears because that's again it's cheesy but I don't know like we should think of, we should think about something I don't know it'd be funny like if we ever had like a like a live podcast and like people subscribed like in the middle of of our podcast if the noise was boom boom hi who just joined that'd be funny <laughs> All right, it's past your bedtime. I'm it's time to go. It's time to go, y'all. All right. Thank y'all for listening to the Living Corporate Podcast. You can check us out on everything. We're everywhere. Just Google us, Living Corporate. I'm checking out. Check us out on Instagram at Living Corporate. You? Check us on Twitter at Living Corp underscore Pod. Make sure you check out all of our blogging content because we have blogs and we have some new stuff coming. That'll be coming. New, fresh announcement, independent announcement coming soon on living-corporate.com please stay the dash or livingcorporate.co or livingcorporate.org or hey. livingcorporate.net hey. we have all the living corporates except livingcorporate.com y'all should know this by now because Australia owns livingcorporate.com somebody write a note to Australia let them know to stop hating a strongly worded letter a strongly worded letter right but they ain't not even doing the aboriginals right so they definitely not gonna do us right huh Ade? I mean no. No, they not. Dang, we just put some aboriginal commentary in the end of a, of a <laughs> corporate podcast episode. But I mean it. Y'all need to do right by the aboriginals. And frankly, y'all need to do right by us and give us a livingcorporate.com domain. I'm tired of it. We've talked about this for a whole three or four months. Consider this, though, a strongly worded uh, note, a message, okay? We we do need the domain. I'm, I'm terrified to ask how much money it will cost. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea how much money it will cost. I I just all right. Good night, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all for listening to the Living Corporate Podcast. <laughs> this has been Zach. This has been our day. Peace. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. 
Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.